Jefferson, Joe Henrik, and their many colleagues. And a lot of times it seems like this is going on. <laughs> um, and it's actually curious that, that that's what's going on a lot of the time because uh, evolutionary psychologists and people who are interested in modeling cultural evolution actually share many, many assumptions in common. And so we all think that humans are obligately social and that we have our species evolved in <coughs> densely interdependent social groups. Uh, we all think that the human mind is full of cognitive adaptations that evolved for living in groups, including one supporting many different forms of cooperation, uh, supporting mating, parenting, foraging, aggression, predator avoidance, and so on. And we all think that the development of these computational adaptations depends on the presence of social group members, and so does their operation. We all think all of these evolved computational systems have components that are designed for acquiring information, knowledge, skills from other people, and transmitting information, knowledge, and skills to others. And not just language, but specialized systems of, of social learning. And we all think that as, as heads that are equipped with these systems interact with one another and with the things that those heads produce, whether intentionally or not. So think about tools, uh, public representations like signs or art, um, unintentionally left uh, things like footprints, garbage, all sorts of things. Um, as, as our heads interact with one another and with all of those things, we all think that the representations and skills that those heads can acquire can accumulate in a population. Um, and of course, when particular mental representations, public representations, problem solving skills, and behavioral routines become widespread in a population, that can give rise to patterns of within group similarity and between group differences. And culture is the term that people use to refer to these patterns. So I, I, I wanted to emphasize all the things that are shared in common because, you know, not all those things are shared in common between, for example, evolutionary psychologists and many other psychologists. But we do share them in common with people who are modeling cultural evolution. So I wanted to make those things clear. So the question was, why do people like me become sort of uncomfortable when people start talking about a second system of inheritance, where they talk about a cultural inheritance and a genetic inheritance? And I become uncomfortable because formulating it in that particular way is mindless. It lacks a mind as a causal link between the two. It invites the inference that a cultural inheritance can exist, be identified, and be understood without discovering the information processing architecture of the many evolved systems that generate, shape, and create culture. Well, why worry? Here's a view from evolutionary psychology of why you might be concerned about linking up all of these things. The mind is not a blank slate or a content-free copy machine. It contains many functionally specialized programs, each well-engineered for solving a different adaptive problem, as John and I have been talking about this week. Many of these are content-rich and domain-specific. They're more like expert systems in artificial intelligence, equipped with concepts and inferences that may apply in one domain, but not in others. Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to predict the behavior of a person in this room, I might refer to their beliefs and their desires. But if a bowling ball came rolling down the aisle, I would not be thinking the bowling ball wants to come to the front and uh, it believes that that's the way to get here. I would be using different concepts and inferences to make that, that prediction. And we would learn nothing without these specialized systems. It's not that we would suddenly learn everything if we didn't have them. They're required for us to learn about the world. These domain-specific programs organize our experiences. They generate particular inferences. They inject recurrent concepts and motivations into our mental life. They give us our passions. They provide cross-culturally universal frames of meaning that allow us to understand the actions and intentions of others. They cause us sometimes to think very specific thoughts, 
to make certain ideas and feelings and reactions seem reasonable or interesting or memorable. Consequently, they play a key role in shaping human culture and society. So knowing the structure of these domain-specific programs, I would argue is necessary for understanding culture because their content-rich concepts and procedures determined what we learn from others and from the natural environment through imitation, through inference, which ideas and customs will spread easily from mind to mind and which will not, that is transmitted culture and what I'll call evoked culture, which situations or incentive structures or norms or rules of the game, to use Douglas North's term, will be motivi mo motivating and satisfy our moral intuitions, and therefore why some institutions will succeed and others will fail. So what's the problem? The problem is that cultural dif differences can arise in many different ways. And seeing, just merely observing a difference between two cultures tells you almost nothing, not nothing, but almost nothing about how that difference arose. Because of all mechanisms can create cultural patterns in many different ways. And careful experimental psychology, even with weird people, Western, educated, industrial, rich, democratic, weird people, is essential. And even better is if you do that careful experimentation, uh, triangulating inferences about the cognitive architecture in many different ways, through cross-cultural tests, developmental studies, consulting anthropology, consulting history, economics, and so on, even better. And the reason is that you can misunderstand the source of these patterns if you ignore evolutionary psychology. So what I want to do is talk about some common pitfalls, some causes of cultural patterns that you'll miss um, if the architecture of the mind is ignored. Pitfall one is forgetting that some learning mechanisms are highly specialized for a specific function. And John talked about uh, the work on kin detection with Deborah Lieberman uh, last time. But let me connect it to what I'm saying here. So uh, there's an adaptive problem, which is learning which individuals in your childhood environment are biological siblings. What John was talking about was evidence for an evolved solution, that is a kin detection system that uses ancestrally reliable cues to compute a kinship index, which is a regulatory variable. The idea is it's a computational variable in your head that regulates various other motivational systems. And that when it's high, uh, that that upper, that, that upregulates motivational systems uh, regulating altruism. So when that kinship index is high, as it would be for usually for uh, biological siblings, that upregulates up upregulates motivations to help them, um, and it also upregulates sexual disgust uh, for incest aversion. So just, just to put an exclamation point on what John was saying um, on Wednesday, what he was saying is you can have the cognitive sciences apply to the study of motivation. Often people think of these as two very different domains, but what we're talking about here is a computational view of motivation. Um, so, as he was saying, the cues for identifying older siblings, uh, one cue at least seems to be how long you've resided with that child during your ages 0 to 18. And if you're older, identifying youngers, uh, living, uh, given that you have mechanisms for identifying who your biological mother is, living with your mother when she's taking care of a newborn upregulates altruism and disgust at the idea of sex with that sibling. Um, and how long you co-resided with that person adds nothing to that. Okay, so cultural differences can arise when the very same learning mechanism operates in novel circumstances. So the usual pattern generated is sexual disgust and altruism upregulated towards genetic kin. But on, in, in Israel, on kibbutzim in the early years of Israel, um, there were kids co-resided with children who were not their genetic siblings. And what, what happened, they were in, in these creches, they, what happened was their creche mates, they felt very altruistic towards their creche mates. They felt 
disgusted at the idea of sex with their crush mates, but their crush mates are actually appropriate mates. There's nothing inappropriate. Um, there's going to be no inbreeding depression from mating with your people you were raised with in these crush. They're not your biological siblings. So th th this is a case where um, you're getting a definite pattern of sexual disgust and altruism towards crush mates as a result of a learning mechanism that evolved in different circumstances. Robin Fox, uh, the anthropologist Robin Fox years ago um, pointed out that there's a cultural pattern to incest taboos. So now I'm not just talking about the feeling of disgust. I'm talking about when people, sometimes there are places where there are explicit taboos against incest. And, and what, he, what he observed was that these explicit taboos are common in places where siblings are usually raised apart. If they're usually raised apart, disgust is not going to be activated at the idea of sex with that person. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you've got parents who both who know that both of their, their son and their daughter are their son and daughter, but they haven't been raised together, they may have an interest in them not having sex. They may have some, we may have some evolved predisposition to think that that's a bad idea between people that we're related to. Um, but since they're not going to have the, the disgust activated spontaneously by having been raised together, um, you may feel motivated to say, no, no, that's a bad thing, and have an explicit taboo. This may also explain uh, Freud's ideas, which are very strange from this perspective. You know, Freud w was thinking you, you want to have sex with your uh, the, the boys with their mother and girls with their fathers and the siblings are attracted to one another and, and, and so on. I mean, you know about Freud. But if, you, but if you think for a second, Freud was actually, he was nursed by a wet nurse. He wasn't, ra he wasn't nursed by his own mother. Hmm? And so if you have a mechanism for deciding who is your biological mother that uses cues like who nursed me, who is taking care of the, the the person who was taking care of me when I was an infant gets tagged by some mechanism as mom. It would be his wet nurse that was tagged as mom, not not his biological mother. So it might be perfectly reasonable to Freud that you're attracted to your, bi to your biological mother. Hmm? Well, we know he was attracted to his biological. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I'll his wet nurse. Um, uh, and uh, Robin Fox also noted that these explicit incest taboos are much rarer when disgust has been activated because siblings are co-residing with one another. Pitfall number two, assuming that imitation is a simple process that operates uniformly across domains. Imitation requires inferences, causal and otherwise, about another person's goals, intentions, and beliefs. That is the theory of mind system. And inferences about the natural world. And many different evolved systems regulate imitation, and some of them are deeply domain specific. And an example uh, has to do with the fact that we're omnivores. Since we can eat plants or animals, um, the question is how do we learn which plants are edible without poisoning ourselves? because plants produce toxins, secondary compounds, to dissuade their predators from eating them. So Annie Wirtz, who's at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin uh, now, ha has done this fantastic series of experiments on infants on social learning about plant foods. She points out that plants are a source of both toxicity and food, and the adaptive problem is which are edible, and she's proposed and tested for plant-specific social learning. And her, she has a great deal of evidence now for an evolved computational system that's specialized for identifying edible plants with, inf with inference procedures that are very, very domain-specific. So for example, um, in one series of experiments on which foods can you eat, there's 18-month-old babies, and they see the model. This is. Dave Petruszewski, my, my former student and her husband, he's the model. And they see him, here's a plant, here's an artifact. And they see him pick, say, uh, they counterbalance everything, an apricot from the plant and, and put it to his mouth as if he's tasting it and go, hmm, 
Hmm. And then they see him pick a prune off of the the this thing and put it to his mouth and go, hmm, same same action. Hmm? And counterbalance the order of those things. And then they ask, they put they put out these two uh possi two trays, one with apricots, one of one with the thing that came off of the plant, one with the thing that came off the artifact, and they say, which one can you eat? And they ask the 18-month-olds. And what they find is the 18-month-olds assume that the that the fruit that was taken off the plant is something that he can eat, but not the thing that was taken off the artifact. That's what you're seeing here. They, they, they're choosing, most of the time, they're choosing the thing that came off the plant, not the thing that came off the artifact, two different uh, experiments. Then they, the, the same infants, they also saw a case where um, you, Dave picks up the fruit from either the plant or the f artifact and just puts it by his ear. So now he's doing something. He's picking up the fruit from a plant or an artifact, and he's doing something with it, but he's not putting it in his mouth. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is the choices are random when you ask which one, yes, which one can you use? They're random. So it's not merely picking up, picking something off of a plant that causes the, the baby to choose it. It's picking up something off the plant and putting it to your mouth that causes them to choose it. And it, they find the same pattern with six month olds too. Um, so you're getting very specialized inferences about edibility in plants. It's not just um, a plant derived pattern for what you can use. So she's also done a series of experiments that have to do with toxicity and touching plants and has also shown that infants are much more reticent to touch a plant, an unusual plant that they haven't seen, than an unusual artifact that they haven't seen. She also showed with this, with the specialized inferences, that the artifact can be a shelf. And these infants have seen food come off of shelves all the time, but that is not sufficient. That it, it, so they sometimes, instead of having an artifact like this, these things shown here, it was a shelf instead. Still, it was taking something off a plant and putting it to your mouth that made the infants infer that it was edible. So it's very specialized. This is Zoe Liberman, uh, one of my colleagues at UCSB, who's been doing research on food and social life. She points out that family, friends, coalition members, members of various uh, affiliative groups, they share food and they often share preferences of various kinds. And she's shown that 12-month-olds use information about whether somebody seems to be a friend or a foe to make inferences about who likes what food, but not about who likes what other kinds of things. This is a really deep domain speci specificity she's finding in these infants. So you could say, so she'll first show a display where these two women, either they either seem to be playing together in coordination or they seem to be ignoring each other, and have their backs to each other. So friend versus foe is what she calls it. And the question is, do infants assume that people like anything that their friend likes? And the answer is no. If the infant sees one of these agents like a bowl, pick up a bowl, not eat from it, but pick it up and go, oh, I like that. They do not assume that the friend also likes the bowl. But if the infant sees the agent pick up the bowl and taste a food, a food from it and go, oh, I like that, the infant does assume that the friend also likes that food, and they do not assume that the enemy uh, likes the food. They do the opposite as well, by the way. You can go from seeing some two people like the same food to the infant making inferences about whether they're friends or not. But seeing somebody express disgust does not generate the same inferences. If they see, see the person pick it up and go, oh, I don't like that, they don't generalize that as a function of friend versus foe. If they see an agent dis express disgust toward a food, they assume that no one will like it, no matter whether they're friends or not friends. Very, very specialized. So the social inferences they make are they're specific to food. They don't just extend to other kinds of things that somebody might like, and they don't extend, extend to disgust. 
pitfall free. So think about if you're modeling cultural evolution, if it had to do with food and you didn't know any of these things exist. Or if you tried to apply the same model of Im Im imitation to everything, including food, you, you'd end up with some problems about the kinds of inferences that people make. Or what kinds of, anyway, you see what I'm saying. Pitfall three is forgetting that some cultural patterns are what I'm gonna call, what John and I have called evoked rather than transmitted. So let me explain what I mean by that. There can be complex behavioral patterns that are elicited by cues where the behavioral complexity arises from the evolved mechanism, not from transmitted cultural knowledge. So I'm gonna argue that our brains are like a vehicle that you could see on the streets of Santa Barbara that's called the Santa Barbara land shark, um, especially when it comes to cooperation, where I think we have many different kind systems regulating cooperation that are many different kinds of cooperation that are regulated by different evolved systems. So this is the Santa Barbara land shark, okay? You could be sitting in a cafe in Santa Barbara and see this rolling down the street. And you think, oh, okay, it's a tour bus. Then if you happen to be at the beach a little bit later, you might see this and say, what? <laughs> uh, as it goes into the ocean. Later, you might see it here on the ocean. So what is it? It's a tour boat. It's a tour bus. It's a tour boat. I saw it go from the land into the sea. It's a very strange vehicle. It's the same vehicle, exactly the same vehicle, and its general function is the same in all of these cases. It's transporting people from one place to another on tours. But it contains complex machinery that generates at least two alternative modes of operation. And which set of machinery is activated is triggered by information about the local environment with the driver as its perceptual system. When it's on the street, it operates as a bus and the wheels drop down and they're engaged and it rolls. When it's on the ocean, it operates as a boat, a propeller and rudder are engaged and it moves by displacing water. And the experience of the street versus the ocean doesn't create those two different complex functional designs, the wheels versus the propeller, it activates them. Right? So if our brains are in some respects like a, like a land shark, we have a land shark brain in some respects, or I would argue that we do, because uh, I would argue that many different evolved systems, a number of different evolved systems uh, evolved, uh, regulate cooperation. Um, I, I am going to argue that we have a system that has to do with risk pool reciprocation, where the lucky share with the unlucky and they reverse roles a lot. Um, social exchange, which is more dyadic, favors different resources, etc. Collective action, where you're cooperating with two, three or more individuals who may not be your kin yeah, um, to achieve a common goal and then share the resulting, the resulting uh, benefits. Um, in hunter-gatherers, you find that with collective hunting and shelter building. Also, coalitional psychology, you find it with warfare. When one group raids people, men from one group will cooperate to raid another group. Deep engagement relationships, friendships, uh, which we would argue involves a need for valued individualities, which is, we think is very different from these other forms of cooperation. So let's go back to the land shark for a second. So the uh, hunter-gatherer life, there's been many studies of different hunter-gatherer groups, and one of my favorite uh, is by a, a classic study uh, by Hillard Kaplan, right here, and Kim Hill, um, of food sharing among Aceh foragers in Paraguay. Aceh foragers, when, they, when, they are, when they're on a foraging expedition, they'll go for several weeks on foraging expeditions. They're very cooperative, but it's not an orgy of indiscriminate cooperation. They have several alternative sharing rules. So, so this is even within the same cultural group, the same individuals for different situations. And it looks like the triggers for the alternative sharing rules are perceptions of variance due to luck versus effort. So when they're hunting meat, when you're hunting uh, animals, there's very high variance due to luck. You may come back half on half the days you go hunting, you may come back with nothing. And what they do with meat is they share it at the bandwide level. They, they pool the risk to deal with these frequent reversals of fortune. I may come back with meat one day and you don't have any, so I share with you. 
and then some other day you're going to come back with me and I have nothing and you share with me. So I'm storing, I'm storing food in the form of social obligations since I can't store it in the refrigerator or something like that. And sharing of these high variance due to luck resources comes closest to Marx's fa famous phrase, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. When they're sharing these high variance due to luck resources, that's what the sharing looks like. And they'll share with people who are injured and they'll share it with people just widely at the, in, in the band. Gathered foods, um, usually the variance in foraging success with ga the gathered fo foods is the bandwide level. Other kinds of goods, they share by reciprocation or trade, especially with members of other groups. And you can ask the question, what gives rise to this pattern? Is it a culturally accumulated package of norms where that are gradually acquired over many generations via domain general imitation with trial and error leading to mutations so that it gets passed down as a tradition over many generations and that that's required? I'm thinking about an analogy to when Rob Boyd talks about the canoe, the kayaks. Um, for those of you who are familiar with his work, um, he talks about a particular way of making kayaks that gets passed down over, over generations and it becomes very intricate over generations. So my question is, these sharing rules, is it like that? Is it because of a culturally accumulated package of norms acquired in this domain general way uh, over generations? Or are our minds like the Sa Santa Barbara land shark where alternative sharing rules are triggered by the experience of low versus high variance? You cannot tell by merely noting cross-cultural differences, which this gets to your questions from the other day. Um, so it, is it knowledge acquired by hunting and gathering? You can ask the question, what about people raised in weird cultures? Because they're not hunting and gathering. So Tatsuya Kameda and his colleagues um, did experiments with Japanese and American college students. And they, in this case, they used verbal lottery problems that were one shot. And sometimes it was, these were very high variance ones. Sometimes the situation was very uh, low variance and people had to work to get um, uh, a better shot at getting the resource. And they found that people, these college students were more willing to share the high variance than the low variance resource from these lotteries. And they found that even controlling for their ideologies about distributive justice. So they got, this, they got these students, what the students believe about what's right to do in society. And that predicted, that didn't, th 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 this pattern held regardless of what their ideology was. You can also ask the question, how quickly do weird people detect resource variants and respond with sharing? This is one of my favorite papers uh, by, by Hiller Kaplan, uh, Eric Schneider, Vernon Smith, and Bart Wilson, um, where they ask the question, what happens when Southern Californians forage, people from a sub Southern California suburbs? Um, do these weird people, and you know, we Southern Californians are very weird people in many ways, do they behave like hunter-gatherers do? So they created a virtual world where these students would forage in a virtual world. It's a game where eight people forage and they discover properties of the world. The subjects are all anonymous and each subject has an avatar of a different color. So they don't know the, the real life identity of a person, but they know, I would know that John is the yellow avatar and you know that I'm the blue one, etc. And each round you choose where to forage. There's two patches, a red patch and a blue patch. And you choose where you want to forage. One, the red patch is a high variance patch with, with, uh, where if you are lucky enough to get an animal, these are little shapes that are running around, <laughs> some very fast so that they're hard to catch, right? And, and some in the other patch slower. So if you happen, and in each one, the, the, the higher mean ones uh, represent more calories, like a bigger animal, right? And so in the high variance, high mean patch, there's, uh, there's a high variance, high mean patch, and then there's a low variance, the blue patch, uh, there's low variance and the mean take from any animal that you catch is lower in terms of calories. 
So in both cases, there's these little shapes that represent animals and they're running around, but it's very easy to get them in the low variance patch and they're not worth as much per animal as in the high variance patch. And before this whole thing starts, they're only given two minutes to explore this world before it all starts, two minutes. Then once you've caught something on a given round, you can put resources in your own pot or another avatar's pot or some of both, and those are converted into calories. And then there's a health measure, right, that how healthy each avatar is and so forth that you can see. And after a round of foraging, the avatars can communicate. They can type little, the people can type little things in the boxes, but there is no mechanism for enforcing contracts. And there's 20 rounds, but the subjects don't know how many rounds that there, there'll be. So what happens? Does spontaneous reciprocal sharing emerge in these weird people in Southern California who are foraging in a world where they've had two minutes of exposure to it? Do they have only one sharing norm? That is, is sharing the same in response to both patches? Or is sharing triggered in response to the high variance patch um, much more than the low variance patch? And also how long before the high variance patch foraging there triggers more sharing? Is it immediate? Does it take a long time? And also, this was not their main question, but you could ask the question, given ancestral patterns of men hunting and specializing in, in high variance resources, do men respond more than women to the high variance patch? So this, this, is, what, this is what the results are. Um, let, me, let, me let me show you. So what, what I'm showing you here is how much sharing there was on the first, this is represents the amount of sharing, how much on the first round, so before they've had an experience of anybody reciprocating anything, right, on the first round uh, from the high variance patch. What you're seeing here is these are curves for men and women for the low variance patch. So if you chose to forage on the low variance patch, what you're seeing is people are not sharing. This is, these two are for when you choose to to forage on the high variance patch. This is the curve for men, this is the curve for women. And what you find is that spontaneous reciprocal sharing emerges for the high variance res resource immediately, even in the first round, and despite anonymity, and despite no contract enforcement. And you don't see that for the low, low variance patch. Uh, in fact, it, you, know, you start out with a high variance patch sharing more than low variance patch, and it just gets more and more and more. By the end of 20 rounds, there's a 50-fold more, there's 50-fold more sharing of things from the high variance patch than the low variance patch. And you do see a difference between men and women. I mean, men are, uh, both sexes are sharing a lot from the high variance patch, but it seems to be a little stronger for the men versus the women. Um, I wouldn't make a lot of that. Uh, you'd have to replicate it. And, and as they say, that wasn't something they were explicitly testing for, That's, but it's something you could think might be true. So in other words, these weird people in Southern California immediately detected which patch was high variance, high gain versus low variance, low gain. They responded to the experience of luck with risk pool sharing. They shared, the lucky shared with the unlucky and their sharing was reciprocated despite anonymity and no contract enforcement. And I would say that these are the fingerprints of evoked culture of the land, of the land shark, of the land shark brain. What you're seeing is a cultural pattern that it didn't come through the gradual accumulation over generations of experience with hunting and gathering. Uh, it's a cultural pattern that's evoked. It's triggered by the situation. Um, the behavioral complexity seems to arise from the evolved mechanism that's activated, not because of a long history of, of experience, um, cultural experience over generations with this. All evolved systems regulating cooperation require, let me, let me just, I'm a little bit hot, I'm just gonna take off. I have a sip of water. All evolved systems that regulate uh, cooperation require mechanisms for distinguishing between uh, reliable cooperators and cheaters or free riders, depending on the kind of cooperation you're talking about. And an adaptive problem that our ancestors faced was in hunter-gatherer ecologies, and, and now, every cooperator will at some time, every good cooperator, somebody who's 
uh, a good person to cooperate with, will at some time fail to contribute due to bad luck, due to accident, injury, they might be sick, they may have just made a mistake. And excluding or punishing people who are motivated to cooperate is a big fitness error because there's repeated gains in trade that are necessary for natural selection to favor adaptations for collective action. And a solution would be to have concepts and inference systems that look for and respond to cooperative versus exploitive motivations. Situations involving social exchange do seem to dis activate mechanisms that distinguish between individuals who, uh, that distinguish between motivations to cooperate, motivations to defect and intentional violation of agreements to cooperate versus ones that happen by innocent mistake. And situations involving collective action, this is, I mentioned this the other day, uh, work with Andy Delton. Um, they, what's activated is a free rider concept. Uh, this was research that was done with an implicit categorization. It's an unobtrusive measure of categorization, whereas people don't exactly know what you're looking at because this measure depends on patterns in recall errors. And this free rider concept gets attached to individuals who fail to contribute by accident or mistake or incapacity versus people who fail to contribute to this collective action by virtue of an exploitive intent. It's almost as if we have a grammar of sharing that's like this. These two sound like a, a, a human rule. If he's the victim of an unlucky tragedy, then we should pitch in to help him out. Or if he spends his time loafing and living off others, then he doesn't deserve our help. Those two, you know, you might agree or disagree with the premise, but those two sound at least like they could be human inferences. Here's two that sound really strange, and I have stars, I have asterisks next to them in the same, with the same intent that when linguists put an asterisk by an ungrammatical sentence. These sound socially ungrammatical. If he's the victim of an unlucky tragedy, then he doesn't deserve our help. That's a little odd. Or, I love this one, if he spends his time loafing and living off others, then we should all pitch in and help him out. That just sounds really weird. And in fact, in the, in the movie, My Fair Lady, um, in part, I assume in Pygmalion, the play also, uh, um, Eliza Doolittle's father, who doesn't work much and he has lots of uh, mistresses and so forth, he, 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 he complains about the, he says everybody cares about the deserving poor, but what about me? I'm the undeserving poor. Who's gonna care about me? I get hungry, I need shelter, I need, I, I, need, I need even more than other people do because not only do I need the same food and shelter, I need more money for my drink and for the women. Uh, and, and you know, some American philanthropist fi finds him the most uh, uh, original philosopher and gives him a big grant and then he ends up in the middle class as to his, his uh, chagrin. Um, <laughs> But it, it, this, this second one is so, is so odd to us that it became the butt of a joke in, in the play. So cultural attitudes and cultural transmission um, might be shaped by these same sharing rules. Um, Michael Bang Peterson, if you were at Royal Mont, talked, talked about this. Um, Mike, Michael is a, a political scientist at Aarhus who's been using evolutionary psychology to guide his research. And if you think about, in, in the 80s in the United States, there were a lot of political debates about homelessness. And the arguments about what, about what to do about people who are homeless were about whether people were homeless due to bad luck or whether they were homeless due to low effort, whether they weren't trying. They weren't, there were no arguments about what follows from that. So people were arguing about the, the premise, victim of unlucky tragedy, or spends his time loafing and living off others. They weren't arguing about what follows from that premise. It was just assumed that if unlucky, we should pitch in to help him out. If it's lazy, doesn't deserve our help. So political attitudes in mass cultures, they can, they can be shaped by mechanisms that evolve for a small scale social world. This is one of the, the ideas that Michael Bang Peterson has been pursuing. And when he did implicit categorization studies using the same method that I inadequately referred to that relies on recall, method, uh, recall errors to see how people are categorizing the, a bunch of targets, 
he found that that the mind people's minds were dropping the distinction between social welfare recipients and friends normally when you see um, things you, you you see a picture of, a, of eight people and something happening to each of the eight people or each of the eight people saying something and you watch this and you're told to form impressions of these people then there's a little break and then there's a surprise recall task where you're asked uh, one of the sentences comes on the screen and you're asked which person said this and you have to click on which person said it and if you're right nobody can infer anything about categorization that you, that might be going on in your head but if you're wrong you can look at patterns in the recall errors so for example if those people w if if the distinction between a social welfare recipient and a friend were, were uh, being picked up by the mind then you would find that when you make a mistake uh, when when something was said by one friend you will be more likely to mistakenly attribute it to another friend than to a social welfare recipient for example and what he was finding is when you knew for these eight targets whether their situation where they needed some help was due to bad luck or low effort it their the minds just, was just dropping the category the distinction between friend and social welfare recipient but they were categorizing the people on the dimension of the, is this person needy because of bad luck or needy because of they didn't try or they're they're, they're not trying and this can lead to these kinds of situations can lead to pitfall number four which is underestimating how quickly political attitudes can change so with evoke culture political attitudes can change very very quickly this is a study by michael and lena arho so the idea is that perceptions of of luck versus effort should trigger different sharing rules and that some cultural differences may reflect different default assumptions different stereotypes rather than different ideologies so they did this study in both the Danish welfare state and the US, which is le much less of a welfare state than, than Denmark. And the question was, how deep are the cross-national differences in welfare opinions? So in Denmark and the United States, the stereotypes of social welfare recipients are somewhat different. In Denmark, people are more likely to think that social welfare recipients were unlucky. In the US, people are more likely to think that the, their people are lazy. And, and, and in fact, and you find opposition to social welfare, this is, that's this axis, is on average higher in the US, where you would be making a free rider inference, than in Denmark, where you would be making an unlucky cooperator inference. And they did this with representative surveys in the US and, and, and Denmark. The, and in the baseline condition, they just said, imagine a man who's currently on social welfare, and then they asked how opposed or in favor would you be of welfare for this recipient. And, and you can see that, the US people are more opposed than in Denmark. Then he, they asked the question, what happens if you replace the stereotype with information? So in one condition, you said, the, the baseline condition was just imagine a man who's currently on social welfare. Then they added two sentences. He's always had a regular job, but he has now been the victim of a work-related injury. He's very motivated to get back to work again. In another condition, they said, imagine a man who's on, currently on social welfare. He has never had a regular job, but he is fit and healthy. He's not motivated to get a job. What happens is that there's an immediate shift in attitudes about whether this person should get social welfare or not. And there, it wipes out any difference between Denmark and the United States. So when, in response to the cues that suggest that he's, he could be working, he just doesn't feel like it, the lazy cues, um, more people in both places, this is US, Denmark, are opposed to him having social welfare, and there's no significant difference between the two countries. And when there is the cues that he has a work-related injury, he's motivated to get back to work, but he's, he's, been, uh, he's, he's made the effort and been unlucky, then the opposition to social welfare is lower in both places, and again, with no difference between the two. So, Michael summarizes this as saying two sentences wipe out the difference in attitudes between Denmark and the US. Pitfall five, underestimating the rate of behavioral change. So evolved mechanisms can be designed to respond very nimbly to changes in institutions. And by institution, I mean 
rules of the game in, in, in Douglas North's, uh, he's an economic historian, or was, and uh, in his sense, which is what are, what are the norms or the rules of social interaction in a given situation? Okay. So if you look at uh, cooperation and co collective action, there's a million experiments in behavioral economics using public goods games, common pool resource games, and so on. And, uh, and it's known that adaptations for collective action cannot evolve unless free riders are excluded from group cooperation. Um, the cooperation will unravel if, if there are some people who are free riding on the contributions of others and other people, as I'll show you in a second, wind down their contributions. And that seems to have selected for punitive sentiments towards free riders. And so a, a, a famous finding, um, actually initially from uh, Toshio Yamagishi in 1986, but then uh, made found again in 2000 by Farron Gachter, was an instantaneous shift in cooperation when the possibility of punishment exists. So this is from Farron Gachter 2000. This is when you're paired with partners. This is behavior in a public public goods game. So you're paired with, there's four people in the, in the public goods game. Um, and y y does everybody, is there anybody who doesn't, the public goods game, e each of you is given an endowment, say it's $10, and you're told you can put, you can keep any amount of it or you can put some amount into the pot, but anything in the pot is going to be increased by some factor and then it will be distributed equally among the four people. So what you find is when there is no possibility of punishment, um, so here's subjects, people always start out hopeful and they start out contributing, this is Swiss francs, um, contributing a decent amount, almost half, or between 40 and 60% of their endowment to the pot. And without punishment, what happens over trials is that people, there's, people will give less and less and less to that pot. That's happening here, it's happening here. But when they know that they could be punished, they could be punished, so the institution has changed. They've been told, you have the option to also, you know, spend, you know, a franc to deduct uh, three francs from somebody else. Um, what happens is cooperation gets bigger and bigger and bigger. At this point, people are giving almost everything they have to the common pot. And then, you, th so that's what's happened. These people, they had the institution of punishment. Then you say, okay, we're going to continue with this, but there's no longer the opportunity to punish punish anybody. Um, you can't deduct anymore. I don't think they use the word punish, but you can't deduct from somebody else anymore. What happens is the same human beings, it, the cooperation unwinds in the same human beings. And here, the same human beings where the cooperation unwound when there was no punishment, when punishment was a possibility, immediately, look at the difference between th these two. Immediately they start cooperating more and it sustains high levels of cooperation. That's just being told about how the rules of the game have changed. Same thing with when you're paired with different people every round. That was when you stay with the same four people every round. This, this data is you're paired with, the, each group of four people is a di your different group. Of, so you would be with these three people one round, those three people another round, and so on, and you get the same pattern. This is, you don't even need to inflict a monetary cost on somebody, or you don't even need to, you can just say, you have the option of sending disapproval points. <laughs> like if you don't like what this person, what somebody in your group did, you can send disapproval points at no cost to convey this. And when, th what, what's ha this is Indiana and this is uh, France, and what's happening is when there's no disapproval points, cooperation tends to unwind as always. When you then say, now you can send disapproval points, cooperation goes to higher levels. And then when you say, okay, we're changing this again, you can't send disapproval points, it unwinds again. So it doesn't even have to be an actual, any kind of monetary cost inflicted, just knowing that tout le monde is not happy with what you did. Okay, pitfall six, overestimating the within culture stability of a behavioral pattern. So, Example I want to use is there's been a lot of work where people were started out trying to know, well, how cooperative are people in a culture? Um, there were a lot of work in experimental economics or behavioral economics in this, and 
behavior in cooperative games is actually exquisitely sensitive to changes in framing and many potent changes they reflect features of our evolved psychology uh, for social exchange this was something that um, Vernon Smith who got the Nobel Prize in uh, 2003 um, he back in the late 90s reinterpreted all of his experiments within within the lab um, in light of the idea that we have these evolved programs that evolve for uh, small scale social groups and uh, Elizabeth Hoffman, Kevin McCabe, and, and Vernon Smith have this great paper in economic inquiry called The Behavioral Foundations of Reciprocity, where they say, hey, people do not behave like homo economicus at all. Uh, they're doing these things that make sense if they you're activating programs for a small scale cooperation. Um, so then you can ask the question, can a single game let us characterize a culture? And People asked, can the dictator game tell us how pro-social a culture is? And so I'm sure many of you know that there was a, 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 a heroic effort that was, you know, it's great that they did this. Um, it was uh, organized by Joe Henrik and his colleagues um, to do the dictator game in a bunch of different small scale societies. There'd been a lot of work with the dictator game. The dictator game, I, I probably all of you know, but the experimenter gives you say, $10 and says you can keep all of it or you can give any amount or not or all of it or none of it to this other person who's anonymous and this is a one-shot interaction and you'll never meet them etc and then you see how much they give and so so th this is a weird game because it's not like what kind of game is this it's sort of weird situation I'm being asked what to do with anonymous people I know nothing about. And it's very weird for non-weird people. It's even kind of weird for weird people. Um, <laughs> uh, but what you're seeing here is that this is a lot of different small scale societies. Here's Hadza, Chimane, um, et cetera. And this is US. And what you're seeing here is that um, in the US, th when they did this in the US, it looks like people in the US are very pro-social. The mean offer was 45% of the endowment. But the question is, is this generally true of weird people or is it deeply context sensitive? And what you're seeing is that the different, different average amounts in these different societies. Just finding differences between cultures cannot tell you this. You need within culture experiments to know. And there's a beautiful set of studies by John List um, that were published in 2007 in the journal Political Economy on a great paper called On the Interpretation of the Dictator Game. I guess he was getting frustrated with people interpreting dictator game results as meaning something about how pro-social a culture as a whole is. So in, in this paper, he each person gets a $5 show up fee and then one is randomly chosen to be the dictator and gets an extra $5. And they're told that they can keep all of it or they can give some of it to this other anonymous person, one shot. Um, and as people often find in weird countries, many people choose to give half or nothing. But he also found that tiny, tiny changes in the game elicit huge effects. So this is in the standard version of the dictator game. There's a there's two modes. One mode is you know I'm giving zero, 28 percent, and another mode, 25 percent of the people gave gave half, and all of the different amounts are on the positive side of zero. That's a standard result in the dictator game. But then he changed it in one way. He said he gave the person the dictator five dollars. He says you can give some or all or none of it to the other person, or you can take one dollar from the other person. completely different pattern of results in the same subjects. So now you're seeing that 44% of the people are giving nothing. They're not taking anything, but they're not giving anything. And the number who split is gone down to 8%. It's very low. And then there's the two, the two modes are at nothing and at taking a dollar. So some people are taking a dollar. So just so you can see these next to each other, this is a standard big dictator game distribution. And this is when you tell people that they can take a dollar. Notice that this peak is completely gone. This is higher, and some people are taking. Then he said, another condition, he says, I'm giving you $5. You can give all or some of it to this other person, or 
you can take up to $5 from that person. Now you're seeing something really different. 42% of the people are taking $5 from the other person. And 30% of them are giving nothing to the other person. And hardly anybody is splitting, splitting it in half. This is a really small change in w the instructions. You would think that if pro-sociality was a, a general feature of people in a culture, they would be just as pro-social in one of these situations as in another situation. They wouldn't start taking $5 from the other guy when they, they've just been given $5 and then they're also gonna take $5 from the other guy. Their, their behavior of the same people is just shifting. And then it shifts again, why? It shifts again when it's not a windfall anymore, because remember luck versus effort, luck is a windfall, right? Uh, effort is when you have to work to earn something. So when they made them do some boring task to earn the money for this game, then you get yet another distribution where 68% of the people give nothing. They don't, they don't give more, but they also don't, most of them don't take. And only 19% of them uh, do the temptation to take $5. These are all really different distributions of responses in response to very small changes in the game. So I would say you can't just say people in the US are pro-social and they always wanna give s close to half of, of what they get to somebody else. They're exquisitely sensitive to the situation. They're doing different things uh, when you change these, tweak these little things. The last point, I wanted to make is that studies of psychological adaptations can actually inform evolutionary theory. This is various pieces of work by Andy Delton and Max Krasnow. Um, so as I, as I talked about on Monday, agent-based models of natural selection, they need to incorporate information processing problems like making judgments under uncertainty. And uh, I, I told you about the work where we um, we modeled a situation involving generosity, et cetera, where the agents don't know in advance, is this a one-shot game or a repeated game? They have to infer it on the basis of cues that they get. And in one of the, uh, and basically what was happening is when you give these, you can give agents that are perfectly rational and they develop their belief about one-shot versus repeated interactions using Bayes' rule, and you give them perfect, innate knowledge of the base rate of one-shot interactions in the population. And then you, when they meet an agent, they get AQ that's associated probabilistically with it being one-shot or repeated interaction. They form a rational belief about whether this is one-shot or repeated. But even when they form the rational belief that it's one-shot, what evolves is a strong disposition to cooperate even when you believe that it's a one-shot situation um, because the gains, the, the gains, the, the cost of missing the opportunity for long fruitful exchange is, is uh, those costs are much bigger than the cost of being defected on once. Evidence of, des of design of adaptations can also it can inform evolutionary theory. So the way in George Williams adaptation and natural selection, he explains that his first sentence is adaptation is an onerous concept and you have to have evidence for something being an adaptation and he talks about design evidence, evidence for a special design. Do you find that an aspect of the phenotype seems to solve an adaptive problem with efficiency quickly uh, very, very well? Is it well engineered for that function? Just like if you were, imagine that you were an archeologist from the year um, 2500 and you're digging up Paris and you're finding artifacts and you and your colleague are having art, uh, an argument about this sort of broken artifact and, and your colleague says, it's one of those flat screen TVs we heard about. And you say, no, I think it's uh, you know a stove. I think it's one of those flat stoves. How would you decide who's right? You'd be looking for evidence of special design. Uh, if it's a stove, you're gonna find evidence of something that looks like it's really good at heating reaching temperatures that are high enough to cook food. A TV is not going to cook food very well. It gets slightly warm, but it's not gonna cook food very well. You, if you're arguing that it's a TV, you'd be looking at evidence that this can form a bitmap of different colors 
you know, as you would expect for a TV display. And we'd be arguing about, well, does it have features that look like it's going to display these constantly changing bitmap or heating elements, et cetera? You'd be looking for design evidence. It's the same thing with an adaptation. If you want to say something's an adaptation for a given function, you want to present evidence that it's well designed for that function and not better explained as a consequence of some other function. So there's different evolutionary models of cooperation. Um, and many from the cultural evolution group um, think of cooperation as group selected. Um, but they have different predictions about psychological design. And one of those has to do with adaptations for punishing cheaters in collective actions or in, in any kind of cooperative situation, actually. So the group selection models, it actually doesn't matter whether somebody cheated you or cheated somebody else in your group. Because the idea is that when somebody cheats, they are a cooperative norm violator, and they should be punished and excluded from future cooperation. And that the reason that this happens, the reason that this th that selection favored punishing these guys, is because it allows a group with cooperators to outcompete other groups, even if punishment is personally costly. That's 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 the the theory. Um, an alternative view is that you've got individual selection models based on reciprocity where punishment is used to bargain for better treatment that what you care about is this person treating me badly and the punishment is like to communicate I do not like how you are treating me if you want to continue treat me better um, and and then what you should expect to see is that information about how the partner treated other treated you will trump their bad reputation their reputation for treating other people badly and in, this is work with Max Krause now, that is exactly what, what happened. When we gave people information about the person's reputation for treat, cheat, how, whether the other person had cheated others, um, and then they, they're playing um, a cooperative game with, with that person, the behavior towards that person was um, the minute that they got information about whether that person cheats them, that's what regulated how they then treated their, their partner. And there was no residual effect of the person's reputation for treating other people. Um, so you're seeing differences in design. And those can meaningfully speak to different models of selection pressures. Because the whole point of modeling selection pressures is to understand the design that those selection pressures selected for. Okay. So I think that debates about the relative effects of these different selection pressures are ultimately going to be settled by studies of the design of the human mind, the design of our computational adaptations. And I think that understanding cultural patterns equally requires evolutionary psychology for all the reasons that I laid out beforehand. That's it. Thank you. Uh, as usual, some questions from the audience following us on YouTube. Thanks to the YouTube audience for uh, putting up with the, the technical mishaps with, we've had. And thanks to our technicians for uh, arranging them. Uh, question from uh, Mark van Vucht. I hope I pronounce your name right. Hi, Lida. Great talk. Congratulations on your award given to you and John. Is there any guiding theory to determine which adaptations require more or less culture in order to be calibrated? You mean in advance, in advance of, of data? I imagine that uh, some adaptations, like incest avoidance, require ve you know, very shallow and specific input. Right. And others, like uh, cheater detection, might require a, a great deal of information. I, I tend to think that, it, that w in general, it's always, like a, as I was arguing um, Monday, that it's always better to start with a task analysis of the problem. Because I think that it'll, it'll become clearer when you do the task analysis 
the extent to which you're going to the, the, solving the problem is going to require very rich data from the people around you versus not. So language acquisition. Obviously, there have to be people speaking French around you for you as a toddler to acquire uh, language. French, or la language at all, and, in, and specifically French. And the explanation for why you grow up speaking French and I grow up speaking English is entirely environmental. The difference between cultures is entirely environmental, who was speaking this language around us, although neither of us would have learned a language at all without you know, a language acquisition device to specialize for that function. Um, things about, is there a way of, t I don't know, Mark, I don't know the answer to your question. Um, I think that you just have to approach it question by question. I mean, some problems, the eating food, which foods are safe to eat? Here's an example within the domain of food. Which foods are safe to eat? For an omnivore, you need rich information from other people about what is safe to eat. You have to see people, you know, eating eating it. But Annie Wirtz's data show that with respect to being cautious about toxicity of plants, that doesn't seem to require um, rich cultural information. The babies are very reticent. The time it takes them before they'll touch a plant is much longer than some strange artifact that's not at all plant-like. And so that's a, a case where the hesitation um, doesn't seem to have it doesn't seem to, you don't seem to have to have a rich cultural database for that hesitancy, whereas you do for food choice. So I think it's a matter of first thinking carefully about what the adaptive problem is. And I would be very reticent to give um, an a priori answer to that for anything. Um, I have one more question, but perhaps let's try the floor first. Hi, I wonder um, if you can say something about um, supernatural beliefs and if uh, things like agency detection um, or theory of mind, if you have any comments on the things that help shape supernatural belief or not, and then um, some of the biases that exacerbate the problems between us with the different conclusions that we have or help build them like confirmation bias. Okay, I feel hesitant to do this because two of the world's experts on this Pascal Boyer and Dan Sperber are sitting right here. Um, but if they'll forgive me probably uh, giving a, 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 an inelegant answer to their question. So what, one of the, one of the uh, they both have argued that supernatural beliefs are, they're the consequence of the ordinary functioning of cognitive adaptations that we have. Um, uh, the ability to have meta representations, that is I can have a representation about a representation in your head and that has a particular format where there's an agent who has an attitude towards a proposition. Like, John thinks that there are ghosts. Right? And the idea is that if the proposition is, it has elements that are counterintuitive, and by counterintuitive, I don't mean strange. So to distinguish between that, um, to use one of Pascal's examples, uh, a regular table, a table made of wood is familiar and intuitive. A table made of chocolate is strange, but it doesn't violate any core intuitions we have about the, how the world works. But a table that talks to you, that violates very deep core intuitions about the nature of artifacts. It, it, it's, it's agents that talk to you, not things like, like uh, tables. And so, Dan years ago argued that these meta representations, one of their functions is learning from other members of our culture. So uh, my favorite example that is from him that he used, my teacher says that there are male and female plants and you're three. And you think, what? I thought being female means you have long hair. What, the trees, they have no hair. How, what does this possibly mean? So it's held, the idea is it's held that strange claim that's not intuitive uh, is held in this meta representation. My teacher says that to male and female plants. It stays decoupled from your encyclopedia of knowledge, your semantic memory, as long as it's um, as long as it's unresolved. As long as you can't, as long as you cannot reconcile it with your database of knowledge. And once you, and it recruits attention for that reason. Um, 
so that you can learn more about it. So hopefully you can resolve it and, and retire it to your semantic memory. Um, it retreats its attention. You have a desire to verbally transmit this information to other people and ask them about it. You know, John said that there's ghosts and they're dead people who can walk through walls. Okay, that's counterintuitive, right? Um, or my teacher says that there's male and female plants. And the idea is that as you learn more, like in the case of male and female plants, at some point, you're going to be able to reconcile it with other knowledge that you have. And at that point, you'll lose the source tag and it'll get put into your semantic memory as true. Um, but something like ghosts, dead people who can walk through walls, that violates core intuitions about the world that infants have. Two solid objects should not be able to walk through one another, and uh, people that are dead should not be walking around. Um, and so that can never be reconciled with all the rest of your knowledge because it violates inferences made by evolved mechanisms that are just there and continue to be there your whole life. And now there's been lots of research now showing that even when you believe that there's ghosts or you believe uh, in supernatural agents, that does not overwrite your core intuitions from theory of mind or your intuitive physics and, and so forth. They're held kind of separate. Um, uh, so, so yes, the inferences about animacy come from the theory of mind and also maybe more general um, living animals, uh, mechanisms for thinking about animals. Uh, inferences about solid objects are part of our evolved uh, mind. Um, but, but the idea is that some of these are going to be very contagious and we remain widespread in the population because they're going to continually recruit attention. They're going to continually be memorable because they cannot ever be reconciled with everything else you know. So they'll be catching. They'll be contagious. And what this last part of your thing was about sort of uh, domain specific in different ways. You know, uh, people explore some of these things more very generally. And the question ends up being, you know, uh, where's, the, where's the way forward with, uh, with looking at the conflict that, sur that surrounds the supernatural beliefs well, too? Again, I'm going to channel Pascal again. Sure. And Pascal says, what do you mean there's no evidence for ghosts? You know, uh, there was, I heard this rustling in the trees. That what, didn't you hear it? That's caused by the ghosts. And everybody around you is talking about ghosts as if they exist. Everybody talks about France as if it exists. I mean, this one's for you. Uh, everybody talks about France as if it exists. What do you mean it exists? And that France can be justifiably angry at the United States for canceling the submarine deal. Um, <laughs> I'm with you on that. But what does that mean for France to be angry? France, there's millions of people who live in France, millions tens of millions, each is a different mind with different representations in their mind, yet I'm saying something about an imagined, uh, I'm pointing to him because he's studying imagined communities um, and social identity. I talk about France as if it's an agent that can have beliefs and desires. It, am I, from a certain point of view, you might think I'm hallucinatory, right? What could that possibly mean? On the other hand, we don't, you haven't called to say a psychiatric hospital yet to <laughs> haul me away despite my saying something like that. Um, I, I don't know if, if that falls within confirmation bias or not, but we have tendencies to think about certain things in, in various ways and then evidence may that you get may or may not refute it. Sometimes it's hard to get such evidence and so forth. And, Ugo Mercier, uh, Not Born Yesterday, his book, Not Born Yesterday, talks a lot about this. The, the other people, the people who are here are the much better people to ask that question of, but I, I, I find their arguments extremely convincing, and convincing enough that, that that's what I teach and what I'm teaching about these things. Um, did I, uh, oh, oh, okay. I have a question going back to uh, Michael Peterson's article on intuitions about redistribution. Uh, so we know that once we change the, the priors of people, we all have the same intuition about who deserves to be redistributed right. or not. Uh, but 
the thing is, there's still some differences. Like there, there's differences in priors then between uh, yes. I think it was Danes and Americans. How much can uh, evolutionary psychology actually explain those differences? Like why are the priors different? I don't know. <laughs> um, they can be different for many reasons, right? It could be, it could be in in Denmark. Actually, there's a lot of there's a lot of there are incentives built into their social welfare system for people to get off of social welfare and get a job again. And there's also uh, support networks when they're unemployed um, to help them through that period. Uh, as a recognition that it will be in markets times where there's turnover in jobs, and uh, but there, there's increasing penalties the longer, at least this is how Michael explained it to m the, the situation to me, um, increasing penalties for staying on it longer and longer so that the more it looks like you're not trying to get a job, the harder it is and the more kind of things that involve a little bit of shaming happen in Denmark. In the US, um, that's, the, 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 it's, it's we don't have policies uh, like that. Um, in fact, there would be a uh, huge opposition to any policy that involved um, having uh, uh, shaming or negative attitudes to somebody who stays on welfare for a very long time. It may be that people's on the ground experience of how often people are just are, are not trying or they're being unlucky, it just may be different in the two places. It may be that what's on the news is different in the two places. Um, it, 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 we're getting, we get information about a ton of things, right? From a ton of sources. We get information from the news, from the newspapers, from TV. We get information from other people around us. Um, we know things about the incentive system sometimes of our countries. All of those things could affect what your stereotype is. Your personal experiences of people can affect what your stereotype is of the typical person who's on welfare. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, I, I think that there's mechanisms for attending, paying attention to whether somebody seems to be in, in bad shape due to bad luck versus effort. But then what conclusion you'll come to or what your um, prior will be about that, I think is gonna be hugely dependent on the situation that surrounds you and the I kinds of information sources that the information that you're getting. I don't think there's an evoked culture of the United States versus Denmark that's activating one stereotype th versus the other. I, I assume that, uh, as in Mark Van Brook's question, that that's a case where your stereotype is gonna be massively influenced by um, the information uh, around you. And it's also influenced by when you meet a person, right? you get information about an individual. I, I understand, uh, Lee Jessam has argued that one of the biggest effect sizes in social psychology is that you, you'll see little effects of stereotypes when some you ha when in subjects who have not met another person, but that the, when they meet another person, um, their beliefs about that person are very regulated by what they learn about that individual, and with very little effect of stereotypes. So I, I think all of these things are going on. On I, I just think that these mechanisms that I'm talking about are what you think are relevant dimensions of the situation to pay attention to. Okay, um, I think th th there are m uh, uh, many more questions on YouTube, and but uh, I think we, sh we should stop here with this uh, red slide uh, that mentioned that th there are, if you have uh, more questions, you can go to the Center for Evolutionary Psychology, and there are many more papers, and I have uh, great memories of the uh, primer uh, on the evolutionary psychology that uh, everyone should read uh, to understand what evolutionary psychology is. Um, I would like, this is the... I need to, Nicole, I need to apologize in advance because um, it's not so up to date because we were cut off from the program that allows me to update that. And I'm in this, I'm in the process of rebuilding the website and hopefully in four months it'll have many, many more things. So you'll find lots of things on there. It's just you won't find anything that's come out in the last two years. <laughs> okay, so the rest <laughs> is on Google. But, <laughs> yeah, John? Uh... Two quick things. I just wanted to uh, reiterate on behalf of Lita and myself how grateful we are to this and this wonderful opportunity. And just a fun fact, Lita mentioned Freud and uh, that 
it turns out that uh, Freud uh, not only had a wet nurse, but his description, we know how, what he felt about his mother if we are to believe him, because he describes uh, somewhere his memory of traveling with his mother in a train. And so they're living together in the same room for, you know, uniquely for him. And there's this woman who likes him and he's, she's taking off her clothes in front of him. And he describes how he's getting sexually excited. And so his, his, mis, his mismatch became his theory of what everybody is really like. And I just love that. Okay, anyway. Thank you, John. So not only evolutionary psychology explains human behavior, but it explains Freud's behavior. So I think that's that's an integrated speech you can you can know. So um, yeah, one of the things that w that was the last lecture. We, we again thank you very much for uh, uh, John and Lila for uh, for the, your long trip, long uh, 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 postponed many times to uh, to Paris. It was uh, really uh, great for us to have uh, you here, and I hope. Uh, that uh, it will uh, help uh, evolutionary psychology to flourish in Paris and in France and on everywhere uh, on the planet because there's a, there's a YouTube uh, uh, transmission. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.